We're proud to announce you. Kids forever. Help Rotary make history at npolionow.org. Welcome to the Rotary Club of Tulsa. I'm Rhonda Daniel, your club president, and we are so glad that you're with us today. As we get started, I would like to introduce the volunteers. The invocation will be John McGrath, song and pledge by Jerry Cornelius, and visitor introduction by Joy Longmire. Lost my piece of paper. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started, John. Bow our heads. Lord, keep us safe in our good works, in our travels, in our uh, quest for service above self. In Jesus' name. Let's do God Bless America. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I would like to take a moment and give a round of applause to our pianist today, Lonnie Leggett. He is the founder of the Sand Springs Symphony League. They are having a fundraiser on May 15th for the victims of the Sand Springs tornado. The Rotary Men of Note will be performing, and Ernestine Dillard and Jerry Dillon will be um, doing a duet. And it's going to be in the high school auditorium. So mark your calendars for that. But thank you, Lonnie, for joining us today. Appreciate that. Oh, it is my pleasure to introduce the many visitors we have today. Those of you who are visiting, just know that we have the best speakers from the best universities. <laughs> Not only that, but in general, we just have wonderful programs, and we hope that uh, you will come again. Uh, as usual, as I announce uh, the Rotarians and their guests, would you please stand and be acknowledged, and we will hold our applause until all have been introduced. Uh, Ashley Thompson is here with Karen Keith. Chuck Hansen is here with Richard Holmes. Delee Lewis is a guest of David Wagner. Casey Tarp with Beck Design is here with Roberta Preston. Nick Jones with Barrow and Grimm is a guest of Katie Johnson. Brian Mayfield with Magellan is here with Tom Byers. And I have my husband here, Mike, retired. And also with me today is a very special guest, Anna Heidenjak. She is our exchange student from Austria. And Cindy Salter is a guest of Lynette Potter. Vic Bailey with KTUL, and I'm informed a former member, is here with Bob Sade. Thank you all for coming.
And Mindy Strain, who is with Rotor Act and Spirit Bank is here, so let's give her a rotary welcome. Hi, Mindy. And a visiting Rotarian, Dan Amelia with Wells Fargo. Hi, Dan. He's from the Southeast Tulsa Rotary. We are so happy to have all of our guests here today. As I said, please come back. We have wonderful speakers, wonderful programs. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. I want to recognize this week's Rotary sponsors and thank them for supporting our club activities. Elaine Moore-Jones with Moore's Funeral Home and then Jack McGlumphy with Max Electric. We encourage you to do business with your fellow Rotarians. Now let's take a moment and let's thank our volunteers who came early to make this meeting run smoothly. Let's give them a round of applause. Congratulations to Josh Herlin on completing the steps to earn his blue badge by observing this Monday's last uh, board meeting. So congratulations, Josh. Will you give a wave? Okay, clap for him, please. I want to encourage you to take a moment as you leave today to purchase your tickets to the Rotorax Club Annual Fundraiser, April 23rd, for the wine, cheese, and chocolate. And if you didn't go last year, you don't want to miss it this year, and it's really helping some good causes, so please try to attend. Committee meetings today is Youth Exchange in room 233. So don't forget that. And now Luann Buellinger, if you will come forward. It's exciting to have another new member join. And she's going to introduce you to her today. And Jake Dollarhide, thank you for doing the, a new employee orientation. Uh, new employee? <laughs> I'm on drugs still. <laughs> okay. New member orientation. Luann. Thank you. I'm so uh, proud that Amber Litwack is joining our club today. Amber is the director of Any Given Child, and Any Given Child is a partnership between the Kennedy Center, Tulsa Public Schools, the city, and all the arts organizations in town, and it gives students K through eight, K through eight, three or four arts experiences, both performing and visual each year. Um, she, her office is located in the Hardesty Arts Center with the Arts and Humanities Council, better known as AHA, and uh, she went to TU, yeah. <laughs> she is married to Zach, and she got married last October. He's a creative film producer, and he was a film professor at Columbia. She has two Boston Terriers named Truman and Franklin, which I thought was kind of cute. And her hobbies are visual arts, photography, and animal rescue. And she's currently working toward her PhD at OSU Tulsa in educational leadership. Welcome, Amber. It is so great to be working with Amber. We worked with her on the four-way speech and then in different things, and then here she is joining our club as a member. So it's quite exciting to see you join us, Amber. And now for some side mics, we're going to have John DeBar come up and talk about the uh, fireside. Following John is Brenda Mellencon and then Tom Clinda. May 4 through 7, it's fireside meeting time. It's time to win friends and influence people. It's time to be heard and share your thoughts. Jeff Hassel, our president-elect, and his team need your input. You have sheets on your table setting forth the fireside hosts. Please take a look at it today. Take one of the smaller blue forms and fill out your first, second, and third choice. I'll be hosting one at the farm on uh, I, the, the fifth, I believe, is when it is. So uh, I put a plug in for that shamelessly. Sign up, be heard, participate. Thank you. I have to admit, I forgot I was announcing today, but uh, I'm here for MSNI Workday, which is going to be Saturday, May 9th, from 8 to 12, where we'll pack inventory to ship to, I don't know which country yet, but we've shipped over 200 shipments in the last 20 years, 
and we are going to actually work with Midtown Club this time, so you'll get to meet some new Rotarians if you come. So if you're interested, let me know. And that's May 9th, Saturday, 8 to 12 at MSNI. Thank you. Rhonda. Monday, June 22nd is our 22nd annual IBO Awards Banquet, and here are the top five reasons why you need to be there. Number one, to see our female honoree, Melissa Arnott, who has climbed Mount Everest a record five times. She's there right now, and weather permitting, she'll climb it a sixth time before she comes here. Number two, Bixby doesn't just have country music stars like Corey Camp White on the voice. It's also the home of our male honoree, Denver Broncos cornerback Chris Harris. He's all pro, highest rated cornerback last season. Just signed a $42 million contract with the Broncos. And he's a, that's right, he, he uh, started for four seasons at KU. <laughs> Number three, back again as our MC is CBS College basketball analyst Seth Davis. This year, he's going to disclose all of his secrets on how you can select the winning Final Four brackets. Number four, you heard his video. Our keynote speaker is former Bishop Kelly, ORU, Missouri State, KU, and now Southern Illinois basketball coach Barry Henson. He's a fireball. He's a terrific speaker. Come hear him. Number five. It's our annual fundraiser for a club foundation so we can make more grants to local nonprofit organizations. So stop by the table, get your tickets. Thanks. Thank you, Tom. And now, Mr. Matthew Bristow. Hasn't he done a great job this year? Thank you very much. I just want to take the opportunity to let the chairman of our board know that if he continues to shout out Jayhawk, it's going to get expensive. <laughs> I only have 10 weeks to go and uh, it's time to step it up. So. Uh, anyway, today, as uh, many of you know, is tax day, which uh, for most of us is not a very pleasant day. But for me as Sarge, I just got handed seven different checks, uh, which is the most I've ever received. So I now love tax day. <laughs> anyway, uh, yesterday was a bigger day for me because uh, it was eight years since I married my wife. Aww. And uh, that's the two of us, married and slightly cuter, slightly slimmer, but uh, we now have three children and we're very happy. So I gave 50 bucks to the club and that's it. Thank you. <laughs> so Beverly uh, celebrated a birthday on April 6th and she gave 100 bucks to Water Wells, so thank you very much, Beverly. Uh, Diane has a birthday tomorrow, uh, April 16th, and she wanted to recognize the thousands of blessings she has in her life. And she said to me she wished that she could give thousands of dollars for those blessings, but instead she's giving a hundred. And for that, we're very grateful. So thank you, Diane. Happy birthday. So after the board meeting on Monday, uh, Karen uh, came up to me and said I should ask Jarl for a fine. And I said I just fined him last week for $300. And she said it's fine, just fine him. Again, because he did an incredible job at uh, Camp Enterprise last week. He was canoeing and helping all the kids, and he was one of the uh, illuminating parts of the camp. So she wanted to say thank you, Joel, and thank you again for stepping up and giving 50 bucks. <laughs> More Camp Enterprise. So we have our two master chefs, one of whom was sat up at the table uh, here with me, and also uh, Tim Nile. So thank you to Texas Roadhouse, but also a big thank you to John and Tim for uh, giving up their time. And apparently they also did a fabulous job and gave us 50 bucks each. So thank you. <laughs> On a side note with that, I did call John and uh, said he hadn't responded to my email the day before asking for money. And he said, can you give me, give me a minute? I'm just talking to my insurance adjuster on the farm about uh, the damage from, I think, the tornado coming through. And if you're a Sarge and someone tells you they're meeting with their insurance adjuster, you don't actually anticipate the call back saying, yes, I'll give you money. So I am thankful that you did. Uh, Tim also celebrated his birthday. His wife, Barbara, told me on March 10th. I don't know what he was doing the week of the Home and Garden Show, but apparently he's quite busy. Uh, nonetheless, 56 bucks for 56 years. And thank you very much, Tim. All right. 
this is the last of the camp enterprise. Um, Karen herself gave 100 bucks wanting to honor the work of Stu McDaniel, countless hours, the chairing it, uh, Brian Bovard, uh, the promoter extraordinaire, and also Marsha Folsom, who co-chaired it, uh, who Karen thinks would make an impeccable future Rotarian. So thank you, Karen, and particularly thank you to Stu, Brian, and Marsha for the incredible work last week. <laughs> And the last one for today, um, so Corey had uh, been talking to Scott about uh, Crescendo for uh, next year and some needs that they had, and Scott sent me a list of um, things that he wanted to celebrate. So if you accumulate all these numbers, 100 bucks for uh, the years of our Tulsa Rotary, 73 for his birthday, 50 for the reunion that he's co-chairing for uh, Northwestern, 44 years as a board member at Junior Achievement, 32 years as board member of Tulsa Opera and 24 years as a board member of the Kellogg Graduate School of Business. I don't know about anyone else's math, but when I add that up, it doesn't come to $10,000. Oh, gosh. But Scott <laughs> gave us $10,000. He's right here, over here. Thank you very much, Scott. And uh, I have a feeling that Crescendo in 2016 is off to a very good start. So uh, good news for the Crescendo team. Thank you, Scott, and I'm done for this week. Did we reach our goal with that? Uh, no, I have a new goal. And okay. uh, I'm working towards that. <laughs> All right, that is great. Oh my gosh, how exciting. All right, I do want to take just a second and have everyone who went to Camp Enterprise, who helped with Camp Enterprise, counselor, committee chair, would everybody please stand that was involved with Camp Enterprise? Wow. You're going to hear more about Camp Enterprise shortly, uh, but I wanted to just take a moment and, and honor you for that. And now I'm going to talk about our Rotarian of the day, no stranger to you all, Keith Bailey. Keith is retired from Williams and continues to serve on a number of corporate and nonprofit boards. Keith has been a member of our club since 2004. He is a Club Foundation Fellow, Paul Harris Fellow. Please welcome Rotarian of the day, Keith Bailey. I'll start by saying our speaker has not left. <laughs> he's using his own computer for some of the AV and he's getting it set up and I promised I would talk long enough for him to be able to get that done. Um, it's a pleasure uh, to introduce our speaker. Um, uh, those of you that know me know that I don't wear a tie often and you also know that this would not have been my first or second choice. But I was shamed into buying this uh, when I introduced Bob or, or Bob Sage shamed me into buying this when I introduced Burns Hargis a couple of years ago, and, I, and he knew that I would have no other earthly use for it <laughs> until today, and then he asked me to introduce today's speaker, and uh, I was pleased to be able to find it again and get it out of the closet, but I may give it away after today's uh, <laughs> meeting. Um, our speaker today uh, is the Jamie, uh, Jamie Jacob, is the Ray and Linda Booker professor of uh, and distinguished teacher in mechanical and aerospace engineering at Oklahoma State University, thus the orange and black. But um, it's really, uh, that doesn't describe uh, well uh, exactly what he does. And, and for Ed and others in the room, he did receive a BS in aerospace engineering from the University of Oklahoma. And that was in 1990. But he was seeking higher education and he knew he would have to go somewhere else. <laughs> And so he got his master's and PhD uh, from the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, he has been working on the subject of unmanned aircraft for over a decade, and, and uh, that is the appropriate name for what I think most of us commonly refer to as drones. Now, I read a lot. I'm a, I'm a big reader of mystery and espionage, and I was thinking before I got ready to introduce Jamie, that uh, the last two books I read, key parts of them, uh, revolved around drone technology. And the one TV show I watched last night had a drone in it that was a key to the uh, show. 
And for those who have started reading Joe Pickett books, the C.J. Box books, keep reading because there's one of those that actually has a drone that plays a, a key role in it. Now, Jamie um, is uh, a, a real leader in the area. Uh, I took the opportunity after uh, he agreed to speak to go over to Stillwater to meet with him and to see some of the things he was doing and his students, and it was remarkable. And there's always a, when you read the kinds of things I do, there's always a question of what's fact and what's fiction, what's gilding the lily and what's not. Let me tell you, there's an awful lot of stuff that's closer to fact than any of us would probably realize. But uh, he's been doing this for a number of years. He has uh, sponsored research from virtually all of the uh, commercial aircraft manufacturers as well as virtually any letter agency you can name. Uh, he was a National Research Council faculty fellow at the Air Force Research Laboratory. He currently serves the governor of the state of Oklahoma on the Oklahoma Unmanned Systems Council. He is the president of USA Oklahoma, which is Oklahoma's chapter of the Unmanned Systems Association. He is a real expert. And when I learned what they could do and, and just the remarkable lengths that this technology has come to, uh, I have asked him to bring a rotary nano over. And Ron Butler, this is for you. Uh, it is circling the room as we speak. It's virtually invisible, uh, uh, sound, soundless. But if anyone's cell phone goes off during Jamie's presentation, <laughs> Your picture will appear on one of the screens, and you'll be an instant Paul Harris fellow. <laughs> My pleasure to introduce Dr. Jamie Jacob. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, I'm glad to be here, if for no other reason, to, to make Keith wear orange for uh, one last time. So I, I will hopefully come back next year. So let's just you know put that in here, or we'll get another guest from... Uh, OSU as well, so keep that in your closet just for a while. Uh, so as uh, Keith mentioned, gave you a little bit of my background. So uh, I do have my bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering from the uh, University of Oklahoma. Uh, that's okay. So my students, uh, when they find this out, they always ask me who I'm going to root for on Bedlam uh, game day. I say it's really easy. It's whoever signs my paycheck. So I learned to wear orange pretty uh, pretty quickly, but. Unfortunately, since I am from also OU, I always get tasked with uh, the uh, uh, roles and uh, jobs of going down to OU and sitting on boards and stuff like that because I know where everything is at. And I think that's the only reason that, uh, that they task me for that. Uh, what I want to do today is talk about a little bit of different type of stuff rather than really focusing on the things that we're doing here in the state. And we are doing some very amazing things uh, in unmanned aircraft systems. I want to talk about the future and where some of this is going. And always as part of this to talk about the future, we always have to talk about the, uh, the past first. And so just to get a little bit of history, there's a lot of history. We could talk you know, the whole uh, afternoon just about UAV history. But kind of two interesting things to point out on the history side. Unmanned aircraft really got their start in remote control aircraft. And you can go back and all the way to World War II uh, and look at the development of RC aircraft, like is, what is shown down here. Uh, Reginald Denny there, who uh, uh, started a, a small company uh, to do this, he was actually a B-list actor. He appeared as Commodore Schmidlap in the Batman movie. And if you're, you're familiar with that, my apologies. Uh, but uh, he developed these really for hobbyists uh, before World War II, but during the war, they use these primarily for target practices because it's a lot better to shoot down something uh, that doesn't have a person in it. Uh, one of the other claims to fame, does, does anyone recognize this uh, young woman here? Yeah, Marilyn Monroe, she actually was discovered while she was working in his unmanned aircraft factory. So if anyone complains about drones, you can always just say, well, at least we have Marilyn Monroe, All right? <laughs> So another interesting piece of history, one of the first true UAVs was uh, developed here in Tulsa uh, with Aeromet. Um, and so again, I'm the Ray and Linda Booker uh, professor. And so those of you not familiar with Aeromet, it was started by uh, Ray Booker uh, some time ago, primarily using uh, aircraft for meteorological uh, purposes. And they developed uh, the Aura, which is the Autonomous Unmanned Reconnaissance Aircraft, as part of one of their uh, programs. 
So it was really one of the first truly autonomous UAVs. It was optionally piloted. You'll notice, you know, it is a converted manned aircraft. So they started with this so that way they could really train the aircraft how to operate, but it had the capability of both takeoff and landing uh, all by itself. And it now sits in the Tulsa Air and Space Museum, which again is quite a, a nice honor to have that here in Tulsa. A lot of it, you know, Oklahoma's roots are uh, very deep in aviation, and we see that in the unmanned aircraft industry uh, as well. Now, some of the things that we're working on, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the stuff that OSU is doing, uh, but really what we're focused on is taking things that have been developed in the military realm and finding civilian applications for those. Uh, one of those is using unmanned aircraft to help in the uh, surveillance of uh, wildfires. And if you look at Oklahoma, you know, we're uh, beset by a number of large fires, 2011, 2012, were record years for wildfires across the state. Um, and we lost you know, many uh, uh, thousands of acres and uh, many homes uh, during those uh, severe fires. And we know we're gonna see more of these as well as homes uh, start to encroach on wildland areas and we increase that urban interface. So we've partnered with OSU's uh, fire services training. It's one of the top fire services training programs uh, in the country. Uh, to figure out the best ways to get unmanned aircraft uh, in the hands of first responders. And to be honest, we don't know that right now, how to do that. Fighting a fire is very different from what we've used unmanned aircraft for in the past, which is primarily uh, surely uh, uh, just for reconnaissance, you know, looking over a hill, uh, trying to see where the, uh, where the enemy is at. And this is a very different environment uh, using unmanned aircraft for this. The other one that's relevant to the state uh, of course, uh, tornadoes, uh, severe weather. Uh, and this is the El Reno uh, tornado back in 2013. Uh, one, it, it is the largest tornado I've ever seen on record, and it has the largest wind speeds ever recorded on Earth. And so again, that's here uh, within the state of Oklahoma. Uh, one of the things that most people don't realize, realize about tornadoes is that we do require visual observation before we can definitely say there is a tornado. Uh, so when we look at radars, you know, these types of things right here, we can see signatures of what we expect a tornado to be, but we don't know if there's a really a tornado until we have visual confirmation of that cyclone actually touching the ground. So observers and visual spotters play a large and important role in detecting and tracking uh, these tornadoes in real time, and they're putting their, their lives at risk. So the two things that we're doing to work on this front, one of those is to help storm chasers, and this is uh, the track of the 2013 uh, tornado uh, in El Reno, and all these dots on here, you'll notice this is a smartphone app here uh, that the storm trackers use, all these dots track all of the storm spotters and storm chasers uh, in that immediate vicinity. So they use this, they can tell where uh, each other uh, is currently at. Uh, and what you'll notice is this particular storm took a very uh, sharp and unexpected uh, turn to the northeast. And that caught a lot of these storm chasers uh, in the path of this tornado, which resulted in the death of three very experienced uh, storm chasers uh, who knew what they were uh, doing. Uh, this is an example of one of those crashes, actually. Uh, the uh, uh, occupants of this vehicle uh, were not killed. Um, they were only slightly injured, um, so you can kind of get a feel for how serious this storm is. So one of these is giving uh, storm chasers a standoff capability. Rather than getting so close to the storm, you know, being able to stay within five miles or so and still provide that spotting capability. The other one, which has a much longer uh, term implication, is actually trying to predict these much better. Um, you know, 2013 was a very interesting year. You know, it was 10 days earlier, we had the Moore tornado, which was very unexpected. You know, as we say in Oklahoma, we knew it was gonna tornado that day, but we didn't know where. And most of the predictions had estimated that those tornadoes are gonna be down in the Paul's Valley area. And that's where most of the storm chasers are at. And lo and behold, it appeared up in the Moore area. And one of those reasons is, even though we're very good at determining uh, when tornadoes are likely to happen on any particular day, we're very bad at trying to figure out where those are going to happen. So we can you know, basically block off regions you know, maybe by half of the state, and we really can't get any more accurate than that. 
But the meteorologists at uh, uh, NOAA, the National uh, Oceanic and Atmospheric uh, Association, or agency in, um, located out of Norman through the National Severe Storms Laboratory and the National Weather Center, uh, are very confident that if they get the right data, which data you cannot get off of a radar, then they can increase that warning time from about 10 to 12 minutes, where it's at now, to about an hour which would make all really a large world of difference in being able to predict that. Problem is, we can't fly manned aircraft in this area. And we were having a discussion with uh, Gary England about this particular tornado and one of the helicopter pilots who nearly got sucked in to this one. He actually had to dive towards the ground and lose quite a bit of altitude to get away from this particular storm. So it's very difficult to get that kind of data with a manned aircraft. So one of the things we're working on is developing these systems that allow us to get this data directly from these types of storms uh, and provide that directly to the meteorologists. So let's talk a little bit about where we're at. And when we talk about unmanned aircraft or drones, so I'm kind of agnostic as far as the term is concerned, so you won't hurt my feelings if you, if you call them drones. And part of that problem is, uh, as an industry, uh, we've been very bad at naming things, so we call them unmanned air vehicles, uh, unmanned air systems, remotely piloted vehicles. We can't even figure out ourselves what we should uh, what we should call them. The Air Force alone has about 20 different names uh, or acronyms for UAVs over the years. But if we look at the unmanned aircraft and drones, they cover a really wide range of different types of systems. All the way over here to the one that we're kind of familiar with when we hear the, you know, the word drone, we kind of see this thing that's been flying over Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, which is going to cost several millions of dollars, all the way down here to these very simple things that we can buy on Amazon. And they both use a lot of the same types of technology. The same things that make this one successful also makes this one successful. Obviously, the one, the Predator, just has a lot more capability associated with it with the, uh, the obvious uh, price tag. Now, most of the stuff that we work on is over here on the right-hand side, very small hand launch systems, and we got our start at Oklahoma State University using these primarily as a teaching tool, not really as a research in itself, which says, well, this is an opportunity for students to learn how to build, uh, uh, sorry, design, build, and fly aircraft. And so we're using that, and that's where we really got our start at and made our name um, in the industry by using those uh, these small hand-launched UAVs. But they all really operate off the same type of technology and the same basic principles. Now, there are a couple of things that make these possible. You know, why do we have these now when we didn't have them, say, 20 years ago? And the first one of these is the global positioning system, so GPS. The same GPS we now use in our cars for navigation. I'm sure most of you remember, like I remember, that there once was a time where we could get from point A to point B without a smartphone or a GPS in our car. Now it's like, oh, I don't know where I'm going. I, you know, it's like, oh, I'm going to Tulsa. I better turn on my, uh, my map so I know how to actually get there. Uh, well, the GPS system, again, was originally developed for military applications. It was so that we could send cruise missiles uh, to various places across the world that would use this navigation system. We could, you know, infantry would know where they're at when they had no maps available. Um, and this has always been very accurate, um, but the military or the U.S. government essentially dumbed it down. Said, well, we don't want everyone to have this accuracy until uh, after the Soviet Union collapsed. And they said, okay, we're good. We'll go ahead and let everyone be able to, to use this capability now. So that's the one thing that's made drones possible. They now know where they're at, and they can navigate from one position to another position. Now, does that mean they'll work in here? No, if you don't get a GPS signal in here, most of these systems won't work either. You need some other type of navigation system for it to fly around in here on its own, or you have to have a pilot do that. So there's still a lot of problems to solve, which I'll be talking about. The other, the other thing that makes your smartphone possible, which are the sensors in, inside. Uh, these are things that, you know, it, when you tilt it, it knows its orientation, so you can you know, play pinball games and other things on your smartphone. So it's these little chips, these microelectromechanical sensors, that go into the smartphone that also go on board the unmanned aircraft that lets it know what its attitude is. So it knows when it's rolling, yawing, or pitching, and it can control itself. And typically, in a system such as one of these, it's doing calculations about 100 times a second in order to maintain its attitude. A pilot without those chips on board 
could not fly one of these. Could fly one of these or one of these, but not one of these. It's impossible without those advanced uh, microelectronics uh, to be able to keep these uh, quad rotors and other type of multi rotors uh, stable. So all these things allow us to do something like this. Now this is an actual picture uh, uh, from Pox Dynamics. This is one of their UAVs. It's currently used by uh, several uh, European military forces. Uh, kind of the smallest one that's currently in uh, the battlefield uh, right now. Again, it looks a lot like a toy. And it is, it has a lot of the same things in common. It's just a really expensive version of that toy that allows uh, the operator to see what this thing sees and provides that data uh, back directly to them. So this is the art of the possible uh, right now. We can do this. Uh, this was recently developed by a company under a DARPA contract and trying to mimic nature. We could learn a lot from the natural world in terms of how it solves these types of problems. Now, what I want to do is talk a little bit about the future. Before we do that, talk a little bit more about the past. Uh, we can relate a lot of what's going on in the unmanned aircraft industry right now to what went on with the automobile industry around the turn of the century. Um, the first names they had for these uh, were horseless carriages. So they denoted the autom automobile not by what it had, but by what it lacked. We do the same thing with unmanned aircraft. Even the word drone kind of, you know, it denotes, gives you that connotation that there's nothing at home in the, uh, in the brain. So it's on an autonomous mode. It really can't think. It's, you know, it's not doing its own thing. And so we're in the same stage right now with UAVs as where the early automobile industry was over 100 years ago. So we expect to see a lot of change and a lot of evolution in the, uh, the coming years. Now, the first part of that will actually be on the autonomous car side. And we're, uh, our um, organization, it's our Unmanned Systems Alliance of Oklahoma, we're not the Unmanned Aircraft Systems Alliance, we're the Unmanned Systems Alliance. So while we primarily focus on air vehicles, we also uh, work on ground vehicles, aka cars, as well as maritime and subsurface vehicles uh, as well. So this is where we'll see kind of the first application. Why? Because this is kind of an easier problem to solve than aircraft. If your autonomous system stops working on your vehicle, well, you already have a driver behind it. Someone's in the car. That's really kind of the whole point of the car, is to be able to uh, transport people around. Uh, but also, it's already on the road. So if it stops running, it's all right. You know, you're halfway home in terms of uh, uh, the safety concern. Uh, and the uh, industry, uh, primarily Google, this is one of Google's uh, driverless cars, has put a lot of money and a lot of effort into this in terms of developing this technology, in part with some uh, challenges by the government as well. And we're already seeing this in terms of a sea change um, in the types of uh, needs or desires that new drivers have. Uh, for those of you with teenagers in here, you probably realize that they're a little bit different than you know you were when you were a teenager. So I have a 17 and a 15 year old right now. Uh, when my 17 year old turned 16, you know he didn't go out on that day and get his driver's license, you know, like uh, like I did or like many of you did, because you're very excited to have that independence and go out there. They already have that independence, right? It's in the form of a smartphone that allows them to stay connected to their friends in the outside world all the time. So they say, oh, I don't need a driver's license. I can talk to my friends whenever I want to. Uh, we think of uh, texting as a distraction. For them, driving is the distraction. <laughs> they would much rather be texting all the time. And the sooner they get this, that allows them to do that and gets them from point A to point B, probably the better that they'll be off and that we'll be off as well. So that way, something else will be keeping their eyes on the road. And there'll be a, there'll be a time in the future not sure when that's going to occur at, uh, but we'll, there'll be a kind of a paradigm shift in how we think. And we'll go back and say, well, I can't believe anyone would actually drive a car on their own. That's just kind of crazy. You know, how, how unsafe was that, you know? <laughs> driving around, you know, people driving in their own vehicle. Let's, let the computer do it. The computer knows what it's doing. It's not there yet. We have a ways to go before we get there. So we have a lot of problems we have to solve. But we'll start to see these uh, come out about 2018 or so. Uh, Oklahoma is one of five states that actually allows you to get an operator's license for autonomous vehicle. 
So there are a number of states, uh, Oklahoma being one of them, uh, that uh, have already uh, made this possible. Now, back to the UAV side. Uh, really, the first area that we're going to see widespread use is on the agricultural side. Now, first off, I'm skipping a little bit. I'm not talking about remotely piloted aircraft. I'm really more talking about autonomous types of vehicles and systems. We could talk a lot about you know, drones being used for photography, for real estate, those types of applications. Those are already going on right now. And those are primarily remotely piloted systems within a very near field of view. And it's going to have fairly limited use and limited uh, um, uh, applications. Um, but in terms of big industries, agriculture is probably going to see 80% of the use of unmanned aircraft. Why? Because we have a lot of farms, and we don't have as many farmers as we used to. So UAVs originally got their start on the commercial side in Japan for this very same problem. Back in the 1980s, the Japanese government realized that they had an aging population, that they didn't have enough farmers coming through to uh, care for the farms that they did have. So they started a Manhattan-style project uh, funded by the government to develop these types of helicopters uh, to use on their small, typically about 10-acre plots of land. Uh, they've been doing this for about 15 years now, so they've had the a widespread use of these uh, across Japan. These don't translate very well to the United States because we don't have very, very many 10-acre farms. These are currently being investigated for use in those types of uh, small acreages, uh, typically vineyards in uh, California, uh, where it makes sense to use uh, these types of vehicles. Uh, but as the technology advances and these become more capable, we'll start to see these become more widespread. It really comes down to a dollar value. We have to get to cost-wise about a dollar per acre before we start using these, and that's really what matters uh, on the farming side. It's the payoff that you can get with this. Now, soon after that, we'll start to see unmanned combat air vehicles. Now, these have been developed by the military for quite some time. Uh, so this one here, we have the X-45 and the X-47, uh, uh, unmanned combat air vehicles, which have been under developed for the last five years. Uh, and these will uh, start to be putting into service in about 10 years. And, and again, the reason, the rationale for this is this vehicle can do a lot of things that this vehicle cannot because this vehicle is always restricted by what the pilot can withstand on board. You can pull about 10 Gs or so before the pilot passes out. The training may be about 12. You can design this to handle about 40 to 60 Gs. So, uh, that's something that, you know, this, this will be able to turn a lot more quickly, a lot tighter turns than this will ever be able to. Now, the problem is this pilot in here is not nearly as good as this pilot in here. So it's going to take a long time to go through that process of training, you know, these uh, uh, drone pilots to be as good as, uh, you know, human pilots. So it is going to take a while. And keep in mind, when we talk about this, that doesn't mean that this is a robot going off and doing its own thing. There's a human involved. The human just sits on the ground rather than sitting in the cockpit of the aircraft. So they're always in control of that, but they can now you know, have it do things they couldn't do if they're actually on uh, board the vehicle itself. Uh, just last year, uh, the uh, Navy demonstrated an autonomous carrier landing of an F-18. They did have a pilot on board just to make sure everything was safe, but the pilot was doing this. It was going through the landing. Now, you have to have... Uh, be pretty brave to be a carrier pilot to begin with, right? Now, to be a carrier pilot and do this, I have to imagine he probably had his eyes closed. And just like, I just, just let, let me know when it's over. Um, and the Air Force also started training more unmanned aircraft pilots last year than they did uh, manned aircraft pilots, mostly to fly uh, Predators and Global Hawks. Uh, now, NASA's working on going to Mars. Before we go to Mars, we want to develop aircraft uh, that allow us to fly on Mars. So the current timeline uh, to get people to Mars is sometime in the 2030s. Sometime before then, we'll be sending unmanned aircraft to fly to Mars as well. And this is originally how I got my start in UAVs, is working on NASA projects designing aircraft to fly on Mars. Very difficult, because Mars is a very, very thin atmosphere. For those pilots in here, it's very similar to flying about 100,000 feet very tenuous, low-density atmosphere, because it's very, so it's very difficult to get an aircraft to fly on Mars. There's a lot of utility and need for this, 
Uh, we send rovers to Mars now. We send them millions of miles. They land and they drive you know, hundreds of feet or a mile. So we've only explored a very, very tiny portion of um, uh, the Martian surface. Now, it's, it's very hard to fly something on Mars. There is a, a planet, or I should say moon, uh, Titan, which actually has a lower gravity but higher density that is easier to fly on Titan than on Earth. So if we can get a robotic aircraft to Titan, it can fly indefinitely uh, uh, purely on uh, uh, solar power, even though the solar power there is, is uh, very, very weak. Now, we will get to the pilotless airplane. Now, first off, we're already doing this, okay? So every transport aircraft has one of these on board. It's just not inflatable, right? It sits, sits behind the cockpit, and it does most of the flying. And depending upon whether you're a Boeing or an Airbus, it really tells you how much the flying it is doing. Uh, Boeing's philosophy is a little bit different. They put the pilot in charge. Airbus essentially says, all right, we're going to put the uh, autopilot in charge and let the pilot kind of change things uh, as they see fit. But we've been doing this for quite some time now. Now, what we haven't done is taken the pilot out of that cockpit altogether. Will it happen? Yes. Why? Because they can charge lower ticket prices. And so as you're going on travel velocity, you say, oh, I can save $50. And it maybe have a little star there that says, pilotless airplane, and you'll say, hmm, $50, okay, I can do that, yeah. So it all again comes down to the pocketbook and when you're able to do that. Now, before that happens, there's gonna be a lot of reliability testing, you know, making sure that the, uh, the public is comfortable uh, with this, but it will happen uh, eventually. It's just a matter of uh, when. So I'm guessing about 25 years, this will start being common. Now, we'll see this first in the um, uh, package transportation. UPS, FedEx, they're spending money on this now. Why? Again, because it comes down to their bottom line. If they can save money on getting a package from location A to location B, they're going to figure out a way to do that. <clears throat> Finally, so uh, Keith, Keith was talking about those uh, nano air vehicles flying around. There may be one or 50 of these in the room right now, so that we've been working on. But eventually, we will get to something like this. Uh, we've already had a number of researchers working on nano air vehicles. So there's one right there. Um, that will be flying around, and you'll, you'll not be scared of these because you'll go buy them at the drugstore and to uh, inject your medicine to monitor your health, to monitor the environment, uh, to take continuous pictures of your life. You think selfies are bad now, right? Just wait till 2040 when you have constant streaming video, right, of these things flying around continuously monitoring your every activity. So this particular one here is uh, designed to uh, inject medicine. So you have an emergency drug, it senses that, oh, your insulin levels are low, right? Flies around, injects the medicine, you know, then it uh, goes back and recharges itself. Uh, so this technology is on the horizon. One of the interesting things that they're doing right now, it's very hard for us to make these things very small, as small as what nature can do. So what we're doing is actually doing a little bit of both, taking things like bumblebees and beetles and put a little computers on their back to actually control where they fly. So we're kind of hijacking them, so we have a drone drone uh, in that sense. So I want to end up talking a little bit about this, uh, the hype cycle. If you're not familiar with this, those of you working in the technology industry probably are. With any type of new technology that is introduced, there's a lot of hype that comes around with it. So Forb actually takes these every year and goes through these uh, uh, different analysis to figure out where uh, the, the new technology falls at or that uh, technology that's currently being developed. So you always start off with this technology trigger down here. You have what's called the peak of inflated expectations. Oh, it's the greatest thing since light spread, right? So we're, we're uh, uh, really excited about this. And then what's called the trough of disillusionment. Reality sets in. This thing didn't quite do what we expected it uh, to do. And then finally get to the point where you say, okay, we realistic expectations, we now know where things are at. Now, even with all the talk about UAVs and drones uh, in the news lately, uh, Forbes doesn't even think we're there yet. So this is what they published last year. We're still on this upslope. So things are gonna get worse before they get better. 
in terms of uh, inflated expectations. But you can see where a lot of these other technologies sits at, you know, things such as big data, virtual reality, you know, things that were going to revolutionize the world. Well, not quite. You know, things were always a lot more complicated uh, than they actually seem. Now, to give you an example of that, this is actually one of our tests. Uh, this is one of our early Mars aircraft projects uh, for NASA. This is not the aircraft we were flying. This was actually just to test the autopilot. We were testing this here in Oklahoma. We're doing our flights in Colorado. Take the vehicle up to Colorado, turn the autopilot on, and does a perfect nosedive into the ground. I'm like, oh, that's kind of funny. Well, we should try that again. I think we do that three more times before we figure out, oh, there's actually a large altitude change between Oklahoma and Colorado. So the UAV was doing exactly what it was supposed to be doing, exactly what we told it to do, to fly about 1,500 feet above sea level. It's just that we didn't realize, oh, yeah. So regardless of how smart this is, you also have to outsmart these guys up here. Now, this turns into a lot of challenges. Before all these things happen, we have all these things to solve. I'm not going to go through these. Right now, you know, the FAA has been very slow about letting UAVs be integrated in the national airspace, with good reason, primarily for safety. We want to make sure that we protect uh, the manned aircraft that are operating in the national airspace. There are a lot of things about UAVs that just quite, you know, don't fit the bill in terms of reliability and their safety assurance levels yet. So it's a matter of a slow integration. Uh, we are falling a little bit behind, you know, the other countries, uh, but we still have the safest airspace in the world, and we want to make sure we keep it as well. Now, we will get to this point. You know, we're, again, we're, this is one of the vehicles from our lab uh, here. This is a prototype concept based upon a uh, maple seed uh, right here. So take these ideas that, you know, nature has been able to develop uh, and turn those into uh, workable concepts. Now, as I mentioned, uh, why are companies and people very excited about this? Because they can make money off of it. Amazon, Google, Facebook, you know, they're all getting into the UAV industry. Why? Because there's an opportunity uh, for them to uh, increase their bottom line. So Amazon is not kidding when they say that they want to develop a drone to be able to deliver packages. Now, it's probably going to take five to ten years for that to actually happen. And to kind of give you a feel for this, this is an example. This happened yesterday. So I just got this video. This is, so this is very fresh. So this is actually uh, in uh, uh, the Netherlands. What do they want to do? Oh, they want to deliver the freshest asparagus possible to your table at the restaurant. So let's use an asparagus delivery drone to do that. That makes a lot of sense. So here they are. They're flying it. And now what you'll notice here, there's a pilot involved. And he's riding behind in a truck. I don't know why they just can't use the truck <laughs> to deliver the asparagus. But then it has to land halfway through to recharge its batteries, and then it crashes. And then you have a bunch of people on video standing around <laughs> watching all their dreams go up in smoke. And the guy in the tie is the one who actually put the money behind everything, right? So he's, he says something in Dutch at this point. I don't know what he's talking about here, but probably about the future, and ah, we'll get better and all this. But... Uh, so far, this has only proven to be a really good way of uh, cooking asparagus uh, <laughs> in the field. So, we, uh, we still have a ways to go before we, uh, we finally get there. If I didn't actually see this in the news, I thought it would have, a, would have been a comedy piece. So, you can't make this stuff up. All right. So I'm going to end up on SpeedFest. For those of you not familiar with this, this is our annual UAV competition that we have. Uh, at OSU, and it doesn't matter if you're an OSU or an OU fan, both uh, will have teams represented there. We'll have uh, five collegiate teams from across the country, uh, the one coming the farthest distance of the University of Miami. So they'll be having a competition all day. They'll be flying multiple heats. We also have 16 high school teams from across the state that will be uh, running multiple competitions. So if you're interested in that, just Google SpeedFest, and you'll find everything you need to know about that that's being held on April 25th. So again, thank you for your time. I really enjoyed being here. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yes. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Uh, and are they encrypted? Well, if they weren't before, they're being encrypted now. 
Even the early predators, they didn't encrypt their signals. So they're transmitting this video over in Iraq and Afghanistan on open, unencrypted channels until they figured out, oh, the other guys can see them. They didn't realize that till after the fact, till they went and found some videos that you know uh, uh, insurgents had been receiving from their predator uh, signal. So even the military uh, wasn't doing this. But that is a very serious problem. Uh, data privacy to make sure that your UAV isn't going to be ha hijacked by someone else. And the data it's streaming is also protected. So the communication aspects of this is very important and it has not been solved yet. No, it has not yet. And actually, my, I originally got started this as an undergraduate at OU. So uh, my, one of my professors there, Carl Berge, a well-known uh, aircraft designer, had this idea uh, for quite some time. We started working on it back in the 1980s. Um, and it, the idea was really just ahead of its time in terms of the technology. So we still aren't there yet. Um, you know, our purpose is not to fly into a tornado. Our purpose is to fly into the storm system before the tornado develops. Because we don't really know why one storm forms a tornado and another one does not. Now, there will become a time uh, very soon that, uh, that that will happen. But really, to be honest, that's more for gee whiz than anything else, you know, to get really cool video. Because uh, it's not going to tell you a whole lot about the meteorology of the tornado. Yes? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, and for those who are not familiar with this, uh, Moore's Law, which is what made a lot of this possible, says that a computer doubles its capacity or its capability about every 18 months. So, you know, once you bought a computer 18 months later, you can buy another computer twice as fast. That's not true for batteries. So batteries have been really kind of behind the technological curve. Uh, you, uh, petroleum products, hydrocarbons, you know, gasoline are always, at least in the near future, going to be much more energy efficient per pound than batteries will be. Why do we like batteries? Well, they're easy to use. You can recharge them, you know, but uh, they're not going to be as efficient for your uh, vehicle. Uh, Tesla is a really good example of a company that's on the forefront of the right now. They just are developing a large battery uh, factory uh, in Nevada to make the batteries for their cars. That's an example of where we'll see a lot of this uh, technology kind of at least push forward a bit, even if it's only incremental rather than by orders of magnitude because they have to build so many of them, uh, they'll get much better at it and it can really increase the capacity of these. But unfortunately, you know, that's, that's really one of the things that's holding us back right now. And you can also see by our uh, uh, asparagus flying drone right there, they're still very dangerous. So that was the battery that caught fire. Yes? Uh, it's actually uh, at our flight field. Uh, it's 12 miles east of town. So if you're coming from Tulsa, I think the best place to get off is at the, uh, the Turnpike exit uh, near the, uh, it, uh, near the uh, Firefox Casino, if I remember correctly. Yeah, but if you go to speedfest.org, uh, they'll give you, or sorry, speedfest.okstate.edu, it'll give you directions uh, and a map. It's actually the intersection of Clay Road and Airport Road, 12 miles east of Stillwater. So it's our unmanned aircraft flight station where we do most of our experiments at. Okay, oh, one more question back here. Yeah, for the at least the immediate future, it's going to be 500 feet and less. So unless you get special permission, for example, in our case, uh, if we want to fly higher, you know, 2,500 feet, 3,000 feet, which is still relatively low altitude, we have to go through a special permission process from the FAA. So for normal day-to-day -day operations, they don't want you flying over 400, or, sorry, over 500 feet and five miles away from an airport. So if you're a manned aircraft, you know, that sh essentially should deconflict both the manned and the unmanned traffic if those are followed. And unfortunately, you know, a lot of unmanned vehicle operators are not following that. Now, you're actually asking about, or you'd mentioned a weather balloon. 
the FAA doesn't restrict weather balloons right now. So you can call in a NOTAM and say, all right, I'm going to launch a weather balloon with my package on it, and you know, the FAA does not care. Uh, so it's kind of interesting the kind of differences you see between things that they've been dealing with for a very long period of time, because weather balloons have been around just as long as aircraft have, uh, and unmanned aircraft, which have not. Okay, thank you very much. A book recognizing today's program will be presented to our partner in education school, Celia Clinton. Look at that, it's very fitting with our speaker today, don't you think? It's always, um, the speakers always seem to really enjoy signing the book and putting it in the Celia Clinton Library, and uh, this was no exception. April 22nd, Joy Hoff Hoffmeister, the State Superintendent of Public Instruction, will be our guest speaker. And then April 29th, as promised, is going to be the Camp Enterprise Recap, and you don't want to miss that one either. You know I will not be here next week. Um, Jeff Hassel will be uh, presenting places. next week, and I was so going to tell you that I was going to do it unmanned, but I couldn't come up with something fun enough to, to say it. So, uh, surprise, Jeff will be speaking. I have to go to a convention, so thank you, Jeff, in advance. I know I owe you three. I'm keeping track. Okay, as we conclude, I hope you enjoyed the song I picked out for you today called Neon Lights. Have a great rest of the week.